right, welcome back everyone. Um, in this video, we're gonna be looking at chapter four, the first two years and the social world. So we're gonna be wrapping up the, the stage of being baby basically in here um, and looking at how the environment uh, affects them and all those kinds of factors. So if you're in the book, obviously chapter four, um, if, if you're following along with the PowerPoints, find them on D2L just like always. And another reminder, make sure that you are listening for the random facts spread throughout the lecture so that you can do the quiz um, and get credit for watching this. So with that, um, I think that's everything. So let's go ahead and get rolling. <clears throat> so um, like I said, first two years, the social world. All right, so second slide. It's not the first slide with any kind of real information on it, but second slide. Um, this is basically going to be a, a, an excerpt from the book. If you look at page 126 in our book, um, you'll find this exact same piece of information. Um, but it gives you approximately what emotions are going to be being experienced at these different ages. Um, so the, the at birth, basically the only experience of emotion is going to be distress and contentment. Okay. Um, and that, that's it. Essentially, you're either you're either happy and therefore you're sleeping or something like that, or you're hungry or you're uncomfortable or you're, you know, something hurts or um, you're tired or whatever. All those factors, um, that's going to be the, the initial experience of any kind of emotion. Uh, around six weeks, we get a social smile. We start actually smiling when we see a human face, essentially. Um, three months, uh, laughter and curiosity are going to show. And we're going to go more in depth on these as we move through here. Um, here in just a second, but I, I wanted to kind of touch on these real quick. Uh, four months, full response to smile. Somebody smiles at the baby, this baby smiles back, or the baby engages the smile first to try to get the person to smile at them. Uh, four to eight months, anger shows up, typically. This is oftentimes connected to frustration, right? They want something specific, they can't get the specific thing, or they want to do something specific and they're having a hard time doing it. Um, and so therefore, we see the first signs of anger, that that we see, okay. Uh, 9 to 14 months, fear of social events, so strangers, separation from caregivers and things like that start to show up, right? That that separation anxiety. Um, they might have been totally fine with a stranger coming up and picking them up as long as they look friendly, and then suddenly they're not. They're shy. They're wanting, they're want clinging to mama um, or dad. But that usually shows up about the same time that they begin to become more mobile, um, that, that, that sudden fear of social, uh, of, of other people that they don't know or aren't comfortable with. Um, 12 months, fear of unexpected sights and sounds. Um, so, so small babies can be startled, right? You're like, and they're like, you know. Um, my, my second son, whenever, if, you, if there was a loud sound, he'd be like, he'd just like spread eagle and his whole little face would do that and he'd just sit there for a few seconds like that until it stopped. Um, <coughs> the, um, but yeah, that, that suddenly, if it's something that they weren't anticipating or they were uncomfortable with, you might have seen videos where people, like guys that have beards and they shave and then the baby's just like, ah. okay. The guy might be thinking the same thing if he just shaved his old beard. But uh, that reaction is unexpected, right? They're not expecting to see their dad go from a beard to no beard, um, which can then affect them in this kind of uh, fearful experience. 18 months, self-awareness really begins to show itself. Um, and with self-awareness, you get a sense of pride, shame, and embarrassment. Basically, until they're fully self-aware, those are not available to them. Okay, so let's dig into these. Um, slide three, and also real quick on that one, on the on slide two, um, be aware that these are these are rough benchmarks. Okay, um, it's it's a, it's very much a, a sliding a sliding rule. So some kiddos are going to experience them earlier. Some kids are, are going to experience them later. Um, as long as it's not like way later, it's not a big deal. Okay, like if if it's something like anger. Well, if it's something like, let's say, laughter, okay, and it's like they're like six months old and they still don't laugh and they don't show any curiosity, that can be an issue. Um, but if it's like, you know, they're like coming up on four months or something and they still haven't really done it that much, not a big deal. Anyway, okay. Um, slide three, emotional development part one. So the early emotions, high emotional responsiveness, pain, and pleasure are going to be basically what they're doing. If they are uncomfortable, they're full on crying, right? When it's a brand new baby, it's not that big a deal. It's kind of like, wham, wham. But when they get bigger, it becomes louder. Um, when they're happy, you know, they're getting fed. When they're hungry, their diapers changed. When they're wet, they're when they're, they're getting a chance to sleep if they're tired. All of those things cause them pleasure. 
which then causes them to relax. And those are essentially the two states. They're either, uh, their body's either relaxed and, 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 you know, kind of a reduced metabolic state, or it's stressed, and that's essentially it. Okay. Um, crying, typical is it hurt, hungry, tired, or frightened. So if a, if a baby is crying, especially within those first few weeks of life, you can pretty much guarantee that it's one of those things. And with, with hurt, that can also just be uncomfortable, right? Um, their diaper is wet and they don't like it, or they're poopy, or uh, they might have a little tummy ache or a little gassy or something like that. All those things can cause them to cry. Colic is uncontrollable. Um, it's actually connected to acid reflux. So basically the, the baby is experiencing severe heartburn a lot of times for babies who are colicky. Um, and it's due to the fact that their, their digestive system probably hasn't been fully developed yet. Um, so the little flaps that essentially keep the acid in the tummy, you figure their, their esophagus is like this long, right? Tiny little esophagus. The little flap that usually keeps the acid from getting into it isn't working quite right. And so it, it lets the acid up into it and gives them severe heartburn, which is extremely uncomfortable. If you've ever experienced heartburn, you know it's uncomfortable. Um, and this can cause a child to cry for a very long time because they essentially are like, I'm hurting, I don't know why. Wah. Okay, stress reaction. This can be extremely stressful for the parents as well. Um, and so this, you know, this, this can become an issue in, as far as even uh, hindering attachment and things like that to some extent. Um, to the point where in some cases, in extreme cases, parents might even begin to feel resentful toward the child because it's causing them so much stress. Um, so it's, it can be an excessive amount of, of crying. Um, if that's the case, take your kiddo to the doctor, right? If they're crying nonstop for more than an hour or two, uh, and you cannot, you cannot comfort them, it's a good idea to go ahead and make an appointment, get your kiddo to the doctor. Um, they can take a, take a look. Uh, if it is, there are some things that they can help with, right? Um, there are some home remedies, but you got to be careful with home remedies with brand new babies because their system is so sensitive. Uh, and so it, it, it's, it's tough. That's definitely one worth talking to an expert about um, if you have a child that is struggling with colic. Okay. Uh, slide four, <clears throat> emotional development part two, smiling and laughing. Um, so you have the social smile at six weeks. It is evoked by viewing human faces. They see a human face and their little mouth crinkles up. Okay. Before that, you might have, like they say, babies can't, brand new babies can't smile. They can smile and they do smile. There's just not anything in their environment that typically causes them to smile. Um, and so that's, that's the thing. They'll just randomly smile because essentially they'll even do that in the womb. In the womb, they've actually, they, they have ultrasound pictures of babies who are smiling. Uh, my oldest son, we actually have a picture of him in the, in the womb while he was, he was smiling at the camera, basically, when they took a picture. Uh, because the muscles are reacting. Okay. Um, they'll even laugh and things like that to some extent. But it's, it's, it's more of an uncontrollable, just their body is just kind of trying it out. At six weeks, when they see a human face, remember, four inches to 30 inches kind of a thing. Um, at that point, that, the face, the, 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 the interaction with the individual um, can cause them to smile. Okay. Laughter, is, it'll show up at three to four months. They'll begin to laugh. I have the extreme honor of being the first thing or person that make all three of my children laugh because um, I'm crazy dad. But um, that, that laughter is usually something that happens that's kind of weird or kind of not expected, but not so unexpected that it's scary. And that's the, that's the balancing point. Uh, it's generally connected to curiosity too, right? The child is beginning to become aware. Their eyes are, are actually synced up, so they have binocular vision. They have depth. They're able to see things. They might begin to be reaching out toward, towards you know, things in their environment but they, that they find interesting or that they want. All of those factors will be, oftentimes be connected to the laughter also. Okay. Anger, first expression is around six months. Healthy response to frustration. We should feel anger, okay? Um, if you don't have any anger whatsoever in your life, uh, you're either, your life is either incredible, amazing, and you have low, no frustration whatsoever, or you're, you're, you're not handling well. Now, that doesn't mean you should enter into rage. Babies at this point can potentially enter into <coughs> like kind of a rage um, relatively easily. But, uh, but yeah, it's, it's, anger is something that you actually are looking for, okay? Um, generally four months to eight months is when it'll start to show itself six months being the average. Um, so yeah, if it's not there, not a huge deal. Okay. Uh, anger, as long as it, you know, it will show itself at some point generally in, in kids' lives. Um, but assuming that they're, they're still responsive to their environments, things like that, it can be a sign of things. 
Uh, if they use anger a lot, that can be a sign of, of certain personality traits um, and also potentially some, some struggles that you might be going to have in the future. If they have no anger whatsoever, that's another sign of different personality traits. And so those are some things to, to just kind of be aware of. Um, the anger side of things can be, can lead to, to, they can be, um, uh, very strong willed when they get a little bit older, uh, very stubborn potentially. And there, there can be some kind of headbutting involved. If they have no anger whatsoever, they might be like just a super easy baby, basically, where they're just kind of like, yeah, let's go with the flow, you know, kind of got the hippie baby thing going. Um, and so those are, or the, if, if the anger is extremely low, um, if, if, if instead of anger, they show sadness, that can actually be a red flag. Okay. So sadness is, a, is one of the emotions that you basically should not see in a baby. And by sadness, I don't mean crying, right? All babies are going to cry. By sadness, there's that sense of kind of like that, you know, oh, they're just, hmm, right? Uh, indicates withdrawal is accompanied by increased production of cortisol. So basically, the stress hormones of cortisol will rise and it's essentially, it, it, it shows itself almost in a hopelessness, right? They want the thing, they can't get the thing. Instead of showing anger and frustration, they just kind of close in on themselves and are sad. Um, we don't want that, okay? Anger is a stress response, but it's kind of a healthy one in, in, the, in, a, in a situation of frustration. Um, if a child experiences sadness, uh, this is gonna be, it, it, it's gonna show signs that there are, there's too much stress essentially in their system. Um, their, experience, their, their, their environment is stressful for them, and so therefore they, they basically are giving up to some extent. And that can, that can have long-term effects on their development um, overall. Okay. If your kiddo does have sadness, you got to kind of, it's, it's a, I can't be like, well, here's what you do to fix it, because it's going to be a case-by-case -case kind of situation. Um, if, it's a, if it happens regularly, it may be worth talking to a, a uh, you know, a specialist or something like a, like a counselor or something that works with, with small children um, to get some tips and suggestions on how to, to help overcome that, which you can possibly do to change the environment to reduce that stress level for the child. Okay. Slide five, <clears throat> emotional development part three, infant emotions. I love the picture on this slide. This is the picture from page 127 with the baby in Santa Claus. Um, so fear emerges in about nine months in response to people, things, or situations, right? Before this, you have the, like, like I said, if you like clap your hand real scared, and they'll react kind of thing. But it's it's not going to be a, a very, it's a startled more in that case. In this case, they're reading a situation and they begin to actually show fear, okay? Like this baby is showing with Santa Claus. Um, the fear is connected to stranger wariness, right? As like I said, as they become more mobile, they, they, they start to be aware of, other people not necessarily all just being great people um, or being like they're not sure who they are so they might hurt me so therefore you know I should show some kind of fear and let my parents know that there's somebody strange coming toward me. Um, so the infant no longer smiles at any friendly face, right? Six month old, if the person is smiling at them or looks friendly, they smile right back usually, right? Uh, at this point they don't. They're likely to cry. They look frightened uh, when an unfamiliar person moves too close too quickly. Um, this is where this is kind of interesting. Santa Claus is like the ultimate uh, terrifying person. Because most babies are scared of men with beards, unless, they've been, unless they have a close male in their family that has a beard. Um, <clears throat> so beards are scary. People who dress differently than most people are scary. Um, so, and then essentially all the elements that, that Santa is, is terrifying for a small, small child. Um, and then we somehow, like, we're like, here, Santa, hold our baby. And the baby's just like, oh, you know, like, we're losing. Anyway, but anyway, um, my parents are abandoning me is essentially what they're, they're feeling. Okay. <laughs> Santa's just keep on smiling, but they're, yeah, it's a, it's a tough one. Um, so separation anxiety is another kind of thing that shows up at this point. Um, you know, a six-month-old, you walk out of the room. Unless there's something that the baby needs that they're not getting, they're not going to really throw much of a fuss. Uh, nine months plus, you know, nine months to a year, suddenly that starts to show itself. Okay, that as you, if you leave, they're like, they, they, they experience stress. So tears, dismay, or anger when a familiar caregiver leaves. Um, if it remains strong after age three, it may be considered an emotional disorder. So this is typically going to kind of, it's going to get more and more intense until somewhere between a year and a half and two years old. 
and then it starts to kind of fade out. Um, if it if it continues to get stronger or if it gets really strong and it stays really strong for an extended period past the age of three, uh, it may be worth looking at getting counseling because there might be some kind of a attachment issue um, and or and or emotional disorder um, in that. Okay. Slide six, toddler, uh, emotional development part four, toddler's emotions. Um, so anger and fear become less frequent and more focused, right? Babies explode. If they're, if, they're ter if they're scared, they're terrified. If they're angry, they're really angry. You know, I can only picture if you took the emotions of a baby and stuck them on an adult, it would be a terrifying person. Um, those, those intense emotions become less frequent. And when they are shown, it's usually shown at a more specific thing and at a, at a given level, right? The emotions are beginning to take on some nuances. They're, they're, they're not just all or nothing. Now you're starting to have like, oh, this is annoying or like full on anger or just kind of oh, whatever, you know, kind of a thing. Okay. Um, laughing and crying become louder and more discriminating. They're not just laughing at everything, but the laughter also becomes more intense. Uh, same thing with the crying, you know, brand new baby cries, <laughs> baby, like toddler cries, Wah! okay, big difference. Uh, but they're generally going to be attached to their, their, the given events that are happening around them. Temper tantrums start to appear oftentimes, not guaranteed. Um, and this is, this is, again, kind of understanding what is going to work in their environment. Babies learn that when they cry, they typically get what they want right? I'm hungry. I cry. They feed me. I'm uncomfortable. I cry. They make me feel better. Um, that learning travels into the toddlerhood. So I want this thing. You don't want to give it to me. And so I can throw a tantrum and see if I can get it. Um, if you give into it, it will increase and it'll be much more difficult to get, to get it to go away. Um, if you don't give into it, basically, if, if as soon as they throw a tantrum, it's just like it's shut down. They do not get what they want. As soon as the tantrum happens, they, they are not getting what they want. Okay, um, it won't last very long at all. If, if it, you know, it might last a couple of weeks at the most, but it fades out pretty quick. The worst thing you would do at, at all, um, and this has been proved, they've known this since the the 1940s, 1950s, uh, with conditioning, essentially, is uh, if you if you sometimes give in and sometimes don't. That will intensify the, the, the temper tantrum tendency. Okay. The reason for this is because if they're like, man, if I just do this long enough, eventually mom or dad usually give in. And so, you know, I'll, I'll go ahead and do this. They're, they're saying no still now, but if I keep trying, sometimes it works. And so I might as well keep trying just in case. Okay. Um, that will make it, that'll actually set it to be the longest and most difficult to, to shut down um, over the years. And that can be, that can, that can go well into um, adulthood. I've seen adults who are temper tantrums and it's not a, not a healthy thing. Okay. Um, new emotions that begin to, sh that come aware or come alive is going to be a sense of pride, shame, embarrassment, disgust, and guilt. Babies don't experience disgust. You know, like little teeny tiny babies, they taste something like we would might consider yucky and they're just like, oh, new flavor. Hmm. You know, kind of a thing. Um, this is the point when they start to experience disgust. Like they, they'll see a poop pile and they'll go, ee, instead of just kind of, I wonder what this is. Okay. Um, and guilt. All of these are connected to essentially a sense of self. Okay. Um, <clears throat> you have you have to be aware of who you, of, of you as an individual um, in order to experience this level of emotion. Uh, so this is something also that with infants. Actually, let's go ahead and go to the next slide. I think it's on the next slide here a little bit. Slide seven, emotional development part five, self-awareness. Um, a person's realization that he or she is a distinct individual whose body, mind, and actions are separate from those of other people. In our first year of life, give or take, um, we essentially see ourselves as an extension of our mothers. Okay, and our mothers as an extension of us. There is no I, there is no you, there is a we. Okay. Uh, and that's going to be the same case, like if the fathers really are, are engaged with the child's development, things like that, um, the father will just kind of be incorporated into that. But the mother and the child specifically, generally, are going to be the where that, that, that feeling is. Around 18 months old, actually somewhere between a year and 18 months, you'll start to see, and this is where also the stranger fear comes in to some, to some extent, 
there's starting to become a realization that the mother is a separate entity to myself. Okay. And with that separation, as I begin to take ownership of who I am and what I'm able to do, suddenly things like pride are, um, are possible, right? Because if everyone is me and I am everyone, then I don't, there's no reason for pride. If I am something separate, then what I can do well, I can take pride in. It's also where shame and guilt can come in, though, right? Shame is essentially is, is I do something badly and I, I feel the judgment of others. Guilt is I do something I shouldn't have done and I know I shouldn't have done it and it makes me feel bad. Okay, uh, <clears throat> So it's an internal thing versus an external thing. Um, certain societies are going to, are like you'll see shame a stronger thing in some societies where guilt basically almost doesn't exist. Other societies, guilt is very heavy. Like you might have heard like, you know, the jokes about like Catholic guilt and things like that. Uh, but, uh, but essentially both those things can are, are, are useful in helping to shape a person as long as they're not overly, you know, just trodden upon by them. Um, if, the, if, if the child just is constantly feeling shame or constantly feeling guilt over everything, it can cause emotional issues, um, and feelings of inadequacy and things like that, which Eric's going to talk about, which we'll look at here in just a second. Okay. Emotional development part six, slide eight, mere recognition. Um, so around 18 months, uh, pretty much all babies, give or take, um, will, will, will react this way. So this is a, this is an experiment. If you have small children or if you have friends that have small children, you can do this experiment with them. Set a mirror down where they can see themselves put a little dot of makeup or something on the tip of their nose and then see if the kiddo recognizes that they are the person with the dot. So babies under the age of 18 months usually, okay, so like 12 month olds, let's say, for example, um, pretty much all 12 months old, old, you put the dot on their nose, they look at the mirror, they might smile at the mirror and they'll reach out to touch whoop, the, the, the mirror image rather than themselves. Somewhere around 15 to 24 months, they see the mirror, they see the dot on the nose, and instead of reaching for the mirror, they touch their own nose. Okay, this is a big step. This is a recognition. The mirror recognition is the, the understanding that this image that is, I'm looking at is actually me. Okay, and this generally shows this, this strong sense of self-awareness. Okay, They're, they become more self-aware. When, when that part turns on and they touch their own nose instead of the, the mirror nose, their sense of self-awareness has turned on. Okay. Uh, most babies by 18 months will touch their own nose. If they're not doing it by 24 months, there can be some developmental issues. So again, kind of a red flag, not a guarantee, but a red flag um, that they might need some, some you know, professional uh, help, to help to help them kind of figure out what's going on developmentally and things like that. Okay. Oh, let's see, slide nine. Temperament, temperament part one. Before we do that, I'm going to give you my random fact number one. Random fact number one, when mice live in the wild, life expectancy is about six months. That's it. What, my, the, if, if they're just out there, partial, mo mostly because everything wants to eat them. Um, but the, uh, yeah, six months is going to be your average life expectancy. In captivity, the average life expectancy is two years with the occasional real old timer making it to three. Um, but yeah. Six months is going to be your, your 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 norm for mice. Okay, back to the back to the slides. Temperament, uh, biologically based core of individual differences in style of approach, response to the environment that is stable across time and situation. So the temperament is going to be an aspect of uh, your personality. Okay, some personality traits are going to be things that are actually picked up through your environment. Okay. Um, but, but the temperament, what they found is actually, it does seem to be genetically influenced rather than just picked up in your environment. So temperamental traits are genetic personality traits are learned, right? Um, it's not, the, there's not the same thing. That's, that's basically what I'm trying to make a point here is temperament and personality aren't necessarily the same thing. They're similar elements, but they're not the same. Um, so temperament, are, uh, well, actually, here, we'll, we'll, we'll dig into this in a second. <clears throat> Next slide, uh, slide 10, temperament part two. Three dimensions of temperament are found, effortful control, which is regulating attention and emotion and self-soothing. Um, essentially, your ability to, to keep yourself in check. Okay. Um, if you can, you know, you can focus in on something and you, you, you can feel your emotions, but you can kind of start to control them and, and, and manage them. 
um, something frightens you, but you can you can bring yourself back down. All of those things are going to be that effortful control. Negative mood, it's going to be fearful, angry, unhappy, um, and then exuberance or exuberant, active, active, social, and not shy. Okay, and this is very much a sliding scale. So on the extreme for effortful control, you'll have the kid that basically, you know, they get startled and immediately they're just like, oh, I'm calm again, laughing, life is good. Um, and they can, you can play a game and they can focus on it and things like that. Uh, on the opposite end, they get startled and they're like crying out of control for the next hour. Um, they can't, they can't focus whatsoever. You know, they're just blah, out of it. Okay. Negative mood. Again, this one is kind of the negative side of things, but if you're more intense on this, you're going to show more tendencies towards fear, more tendencies towards anger and, and be just being unhappy. You know, the grouchy little baby kind of thing. There's not a whole lot of them that are really grouchy, but the fearful and angry potential are there. They get frustrated easily, right? I want this thing. I can't get the thing. Ah! You know, kind of a thing. Um, on the other side, they're like, I can't get the thing. Eh, oh, well, I'll go figure out something else. Okay. Um, exuberant. It's going to be how, how active are they? Are they up and around and doing stuff and moving and you know climbing things? And when they're able to, if they're physically able to, um, they're 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 able to and willing to engage with with strangers to some extent at least, right? They might be a little bit shy and hesitant at first, but once they see like mom or dad is like okay with it, okay, we're okay with it too. Um, and they, they have that ability to to engage. So each dimension affects later personality and achievement. What they found are people who are high in exuberance and effortful control and low in negative mood typically have more success in life overall. Okay. Uh, at least within the United States. So that's, you know, Western world, because that's, those are the things that we basically kind of pride or prize as, as uh, good traits, right? We want kids who aren't shy. We want kids who are emotionally stable and, and aren't grouchy and things like that. Um, it's associated with distinctive brain patterns and behaviors. All three of these things they found there are parts of the brain that basically are firing in certain ways that will make it more or less likely to, to fall high or low in these given areas. Okay, there's a picture on, on slide 11. You can find the same picture on, on page 131. Um, it's called, Do Babies' Temperaments Change? Okay, um, so sometimes it's possible for a temperament to change, right? It's genetic, but environment can influence it, right? Where is that, that nature nurture? The, the 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 environment works upon what you are given by nature. Um, so you did a study and they brought a bunch of kiddos in. Um, they they uh, initially at uh, four months old and they they looked at what their reactions were. Okay, um, were they fearful or were they positive? So in other words, like when we look at those the, the three areas, did they show more like effortful control, like high levels of effortful effortful control and exuberance? relatively low in negative mood, or was it the vice versa? You know, maybe lower levels of effortful control and exuberance and high levels of negative mood. Um, and then they brought them in occasionally to see how they reacted, okay? Um, what they found out of the babies who came in and initially were fearful, 42% of them were fearful every single time they came in. So they came in at, at four months, nine months, 14 months, 24 months, and then 48 months. And they still showed signs of fear. Okay. 44% um, of those children that came in and were initially fearful uh, was variable. So in other words, they might've been fearful the very first time and they might have uh, you know, been fearful the next time and then not, and then yes, and then no, okay, kind of a thing. And then 12% of them, so out of out of a hundred kids, twelve of them uh, were positive every later time. They basically that they were fearful the first time, and then every time after that, they were positive and life was good. Okay, uh, <clears throat> so interesting stuff. On the other side, people, kids who were positive, eighty percent of them remained positive every time they came in. Uh, Fifteen percent were variable, and five percent were fearful every single time that they came in after the initial time. Um, what this showed, the researchers, and what they looked at then is they, they also observed how the parents interact with the child. And what they found was that the parents' actions uh, towards the child with the genetic tendency, so a, a child who genetically tends to be positive, if the parents are supportive of that, they are likely to remain positive and reduces the chances of fear and things like that. Um, on the other hand, 
if they're very negative parents, they can basically shut down that positivity and vice versa, right? If the child is positive or negative, has, has a fearful tendency, if the parents can handle that child well, they can basically give them an environment that reduces the negative effects of that fearfulness, which then you end up with either the variable or the positive child after that. Okay. Um, is it easy to change? No. The natural, the instinct of that child is going to still be fearful or positive, right? The deep down root of who they are is going to be there. But they've learned to either embrace it or not, depending on how their environment has, has shaped them. The nurture aspect of things. Okay. Slide 12, development of social bonds, part one. Synchrony. <clears throat> Coordinated, rapid, smooth exchange of responses between a caregiver and an infant. So synchrony is in the first few months, um, and this is going to be developed initially with the mother, right? This is where, where it becomes more frequent and elaborate as you, as you have time together. Um, but what this does is like the baby smiles and looks happy, and the, the person who is synchronized with them smiles and looks happy, right? You are mirroring the emotions that the kiddo is giving to you. Um, and so you'll, you'll, and this basically is teaching the child what the emotion that they're feeling looks like. So it helps infants to learn to read others' emotions and to develop the skills of social interaction. It usually begins with parents imitating the infants, right? Baby's like, mm. and the dad's like, or mom is like, mm. you know, oh, you look so sad. Okay. And they're like, their brain is like, oh, this is what that emotion looks like. Um, the baby's kind of grouchy and you're like, grouchy back at him. We do, we do this automatically. Okay. We aren't taught to do this. It just when you see it, when you're working with a baby, you we automatically do this. If you are close friends with somebody and they have a certain emotion, there's a good chance you're going to experience that same emotion. Um, this is also to some extent even how how movies and things work, we, where we feel the emotions of the actors. We have a we develop a sense of synchrony. We 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 are feeling through the other. Um, but this is especially important in infancy and in toddlerhood. Okay. Okay, <clears throat> is synchrony needed for normal development? Experiments using the still face technique. And so with this one, um, I actually have a video that I want you to watch. If you if you go to this week's uh, video section, there's a thing called still face experiment, Dr. Edward Tronick. Um, and you will see a still face experiment done in, 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 in action, basically. Um, it's very stressful to watch, I have to say. So just a heads up on that. Like if you're experiencing like severe anxiety or something, it might, it might not be the best one to watch. But... Um, and basically what the experiment is, is that you, you bring in a, a mother and a child who are, are synchronized, right? They're, they're, they're playing with each other. They're doing things that moms and babies do. Um, and then at some point, the, the, the researcher will tell them, like now, and they'll say now, okay? And the mother will turn away and come back with absolutely no emotion. So no matter what the baby does, there is no emotion shown whatsoever. So the baby's laughing and the mother's just staring. The baby's crying, and the mother's just staring. The baby is cooing and screaming and doing whatever, and the mother is just staring. Okay, And they do this for a set amount of time. Um, about two minutes usually is about the maximum that I've, I've seen done. Uh, this is extremely stressful for babies. They've actually done things where they're, they're, they're monitoring blood work on the baby while they're in the process of this, and the cortisol levels just go through the roof. Um, and then as soon as the mother re-engages, that cortisol just drops off. I mean, it, it's not like immediate, right? Uh, our hormones take a while to kind of work through our system. But at the same time, it, it immediately begins to decrease. And the production of new cortisol is reduced significantly. Um, so they're very upset by still face. And they begin to show all the signs of stress. Um, the conclusions were that parents' responsiveness to an infant aids psychological and biological development. Infants' brains need social interaction to develop to their fullest. So I recommend actually pausing the video and just watch that one real quick if you can, um, just because it, it really does, it will make this make sense, okay? Now, why is this important today? A um, Couple reasons, right? Um, so in the past, we really didn't have that many distractions. Like you, you might be working on like, you know, cooking food or something like that. But today, the biggest problem is that the still face experiment is basically that unresponsiveness, right? The baby is trying to give you cues that they're wanting you to engage with them and you're not engaging. Okay, this is what we, like, right? Laugh out loud, ha oh, oh. ha, you're crazy. This is amazing, best thing I've ever seen. Okay, no emotion. We're, 
we're essentially doing a still face. If you're with a child and you have this in your hand while you're with them, you are doing an uncontrolled still face experiment and who knows how long you're doing it to them. Okay. Um, if you are working with a baby, if you have a baby and they're awake and you're wanting to play, put this away. This is going to cause issues with you and your child and potentially the attachment that they have to you. Okay. At the very, at best, you're giving them a significant amount of stress. At worst, you're basically damaging them. Um, so don't do it. Put your phone away. Okay. Turn the TV off. Baby shouldn't be watching TV anyway. Turn the TV off. Okay. Uh, takes a little while for your brain to basically like blah and get over the fact that you're addicted to screens like 99% of Americans are. But that's okay. It's worth it for the baby. Okay. Um, 14. Development of social bonds part two. Attachment. Um, so lasting emotional bond that one person has with another. Like, oh, that's, that's informative. Okay. Basically, attachment is just that, you know, you have a, a connection with a person, emotional connection with them. Begins to form in early infancy and influences a person's close relationships throughout life. The better your attachments are as a, as a baby, the more capable you will be of, of forming good, strong attachments in adulthood. Um, this is one that Erickson and Freud both argued for, and they were both right. They basically, it's true. Uh, if you don't have good attachment and in, in, in infancy, um, so like, let's say as an adult, you have an issue with like commitment, right? You don't really, you have a hard time trusting people or, or that like, you know, you're just waiting for them to leave or things like that. A lot of times those can actually be rooted in that first year of life and how you were treated. Not guaranteed. You might've been had a, an amazing infancy and then just things in other later times in life have affected it. Um, but oftentimes what they found is that it's true that the, that, that first year of life, there was some kind of disconnect, right? Okay, put the phone away. Okay, um, so, sorry. Slide 15, <clears throat> attachment types part one. And I have another video actually on this so you can actually see them um, being played out. If you go to the secure, insecure, avoidant, ambivalent attachment in mothers and babies in this week's videos, you can, you can watch it and kind of see it actually playing out. Um, so insecure avoidant attachment type A. And you can see these. Where are they listed? Ah, here we go. Page 135, there's a, there's a list of them. Um, so if you want to kind of mark that in your book, page 135. Um, insecure avoidant attachment or type A is an infant avoids connection with the caregiver as when the infant seems not to care about the caregiver's presence, departure, or return. So in these experiments, what they did is they, they, they bring the caregiver in with the baby. Okay. Usually the baby was big enough to actually like move around and stuff, right? They're like in that year old to two year old level. Um, and then uh, they would, they'd have some, they'd have a nice room and they have toys and things in there. Um, baby's playing with the toys or whatever, maybe engaging with the mother or the father, whoever happens to be there. Usually it's the mother, but, um, and at some point the mother leaves. That's not for very long. They just step out of the room and they watch to see what the baby does with insecure avoidant attachment. Basically when the mother leaves or the caregiver leaves, baby couldn't care less. Mother eventually comes back. Baby couldn't care less. Okay. There's, there's very little attachment basically in this. Um, secure attachment or type B is an infant uh, obtains both comfort and confidence from the presence of his or her caregiver. There is attachment. The mother or, or caregiver leaves. There's distress. There's obvious distress shown. They cry. You know, they show, they show signs of like, where did they go? Mother or, or caregiver comes back. They, the, they allow the, the caregiver to offer them comfort. They are comforted by the caregiver, soothed, and then they go back to playing, um, after that. Next slide, slide 16, attachment types part two. Um, insecure, resistant, ambivalent attachment or type C is an infant's anxiety and uncertainty are evident as when the infant becomes very upset at separation from the caregiver and both resists and seeks contact on reunion. Okay. Um, basically, in this case, the caregiver leaves. Kid is just like distraught. Okay. Caregiver comes back. And the baby ignores them or, or like walks away from them. It's like, I don't want this. Nope, nope, nope. You like pick them up and they're like, nope, not going to look at you. Nope, nope, nope. Okay. Um, 
this is a sign of, of, of basically a, a, a not, it's a, it's a negative attachment type. Um, the baby is looking for assurance while at the same time is unable to actually seek comfort from their caregiver. Disorganized attachment is where it's kind of all over the place. Um, so sometimes it looks like type A, sometimes it looks like type C, generally. It's very rarely going to look like type B. So sometimes the caregiver leaves and there's this zero reaction, okay? <clears throat> uh, other times the caregiver leaves and they're just like frantic. Uh, caregiver comes back and they just relax and they just kind of go back to playing and they don't really give a rip. And the mother's like trying to engage and they're like, nope, don't really care. Or they seek it, but then they don't want it. They're slapping at the mom or the dad or whatever, okay? Um, those are all can be signs of, of this disorganized attachment types. Uh, so slide 17, measuring attachment, Ainsworth, and don't forget there's the videos, you can watch that too. Uh, so strange situation, a lab, and this is basically what I just explained, what they did for the, for the experiment to kind of figure this one out. It's a laboratory procedure uh, for measuring attachment by evoking infants' reactions to stress. Okay, they had exploratory toys, secure toddler plays happily. Um, Reaction to the caregiver's departure, a secure toddler misses the caregiver. Reaction to the caregiver's return, a secure toddler welcomes the caregiver's reappearance. Slide 18, you can see a picture of a child who has secure attachment, basically. Kid is playing, no problems. Caregiver leaves, some distress. Caregiver comes back, they're comforted. Okay. Slide 19, um, insights from Romania. So I mentioned this in the last lecture, or the last chapter. Um, late 1980s, Romania had a, a, they were communist at that time, and their goal was to basically increase their workforce. And so they were forcing uh, families to have as many children as possible. Um, problem was, is that the families couldn't afford to have as many children as possible. And so they began to just abandon children all over the place. Um, so the, the state basically formed uh, orphanages but the orphanages were severely undermanned for how many babies that they had to deal with. Um, so Romania, they, they started doing international adoptions to try to basically take care of this baby problem. Um, infants adopted before six months fared the best. They had very little negative effect. Those adopted after 12 months often suffered a variety of adverse outcomes. These orphanages were pretty much awful. Okay. Um, like I said, they were very undermanned. So what they had is every baby was on a regime, a schedule. They were fed at a specific time, no matter what. That's all they got. And they got the same amount, no matter what. Um, they were Their diapers were changed on schedule. So if you pooped your diaper one minute after your diaper was changed, you sat there in your poop for three hours until the next diaper changing time. Um, you were held for a set amount of time, usually it was only about 20 minutes a day. So out of a 24 hour period, the baby was only held for about 20 minutes. Um, I actually worked with a guy who, that this was his specialty, was working with, with people who were adopted in the United States and then when they got older, um, started having issues. He's, he worked specifically with young men um, that were from this Romanian, uh, these Romanian orphanages. Um, and he was, it was, it was hard. I mean, he was an expert in it and it was hard. Uh, they were antisocial. They had they had severe uh, they had tendencies toward basically where they just didn't care about anybody. They were one hundred percent looking out for themselves. They didn't trust anybody. They thought everyone else was out to get them. You know, the only person they could basically rely upon was themselves. Um, they had lots of sexual issues where they were uh, abusive toward other people sexually, and so this this is where a lot of times they would end up in, with him. Uh, is because he would then help them try to overcome it. Some of them he was able to help, and they were they were able to man they managed to get into like functional level at least within society. Some of them he he lost one guy moved to he like, turned eighteen just moved to Alaska and they never heard from him again. Um, so yeah, I mean there's there was there was some sad sad things. So <clears throat> yeah, think about that. Like what are, looking at what we just learned, how would this affect them? Okay, how might this come out to be? Why would this maybe occur? Okay, slide 20, predictors of attachment type, and you can find this information actually on page 139. Secure attachment uh, or type B is more likely if the parent is usually sensitive and responsive to the infant's needs. Uh, the infant-parent relationship is high in synchrony, right? Lots of, lots of interaction happening. The infant's temperament is easy, okay? So if the temperament is hard, like if they're fearful and all those kinds of things and they cry easily and they're angry all the time, things like that, 
um, it's it's much more difficult for the for attachment to occur, right? The parents don't don't react as well. Um, if the child is easy, easygoing, they're happy babies, and they you know you can take care of them relatively easy. They don't cry all the time. They're not angry and things like that. Um, a secure attachment is much more likely to happen. Parents are not stressed about income, other children, or their marriage. Um, and if the parents have a working model of secure attachment to their own parents, we generally will do what we have seen, right? Um, which is why abusive situations a lot of times continue generation after generation. Good families generally have good kids that have good families later on. Um, and all of those things are going to be part of this. Okay. Insecure attachment. The parent, if the, if the parent mistreats the child, they're much more likely. If it's neglect, they're type A, right? Um, so if, if the parent isn't like beating the kid or, or hurting the kid intentionally, they're just not really interacting with the kid at all, type A is more likely because essentially the kid is like that they're not someone, there's not a reason to be really aware of them. They're just kind of there. Um, if they are being abused, type C or type D are more likely, right? So the, the like you show distress at their leaving, but at the same time you don't, you can't receive comfort from them. Type D, you never know exactly what mom or dad is going to do. So therefore, man, sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. You know, it's uncomfortable. Um, if the mo if the mother is mentally ill, if she struggles struggles with paranoia, type D will increase. Uh, depression, type C will increase. She wants the mom to engage, but the mom won't engage. Okay, so therefore, you learn you you might show distress when mom leaves, but you you don't know how you can't really receive comfort from them very easily because you never learned to do that. Um, parents are highly stressed about income, other children, or their marriage. You oftentimes have type A or type D, again, depending on. Type A is going to be that they're just in the background, so no big deal. Type D, sometimes they're there, sometimes they're not. Sometimes they're good, sometimes they're bad. Okay, stuff like that. Parents are intrusive and controlling. Parental uh, domination increases type A. Uh, parents have alcohol use disorder. If the father's alcoholic, it increases chances of type A. If the mother's alcoholic, it increases chances of type D. Um, child's temperament is difficult. Oftentimes you'll get type C, right? And this can just be, you might be doing everything right as a parent. The kid just can't receive comfort because of how their temperament is. Uh, and that makes type C more likely, right? They're, they just stress when you're gone there because they're fearful and like, ah, the anger. And then you come back and they're like, ah, why would you leave me? You're a terrible person. Okay, that, that's basically going to be a temperamental factor. Instead of receiving comfort from you, the fact that you're back. Um, child's pyramid is slow to warm up, correlates oftentimes with type A. They just don't connect easy, okay, and that can happen. Again, you can find that tab table on page 139. Random fact number two, ready? Lettuce is a member of the sunflower family. There you go. So when you're eating lettuce, you're also eating kind of like a sunflower. Um, it's just the leaves. Okay. <clears throat> Not really. They're not. They're not actually a sunflower, but they are related closely. Uh, slide twenty-one: development of social bonds, part three. Social referencing. Um, seeking emotional responses or information from other people is essentially what this is. We continue to do this throughout our entire life, right? If I put you in a situation that you weren't comfortable, but I gave you, but you had some friends there with you, there's a good chance that you'd be looking around to see what everyone else is doing, especially if they're comfortable with it to kind of figure out what you're supposed to do. Let's say you go to a really fancy dinner and you sit down and there's like 12 pieces of silverware in front of you. And you're like, and there's like four glasses and you got like four plates plus a big old thing underneath it. And you're like, what the heck is this for? Okay. Um, if you're not already used to that and there's like these little tweezer things, you're like, what is this for? Okay. Um, it's an asparagus tongue. Okay. But anyway, if it's really fancy. Uh, but let's say that's how it is and you're not used to it. There's a very good chance when you sit down, you're going to go whoop and you're going to look around to see what everyone else is doing to figure out what you need to do. This is social referencing. Kids do this automatically, okay? Um, so seeking emotional responses or information from other people. They're looking around, they're trying to see like, is this good, bad? You know, how am I, what, what am I doing? So observing someone else's expressions and reactions and using the other person as a social reference. Something happens and you'll notice the kid like, and looks right at mom or dad right in the face because they're wanting to see what mom or dad is gonna do. If mom or dad laughs, then they're like, okay, that was a good thing, good. If mom or dad get angry, then ooh, that's not good, you know, okay. Um, and they're gonna be they're gonna be trying to figure this out. If they're not, if it's a new, a new event that they're not used to, generally they're gonna be looking for confirmation from others of what they should do. Um, slide 22. <coughs> uh, 
Development of Social Bonds, Part 4, Parental Social Referencing, so mothers use a variety of expressions, vocalizations, and gestures to convey social information to their infants. Um, synchrony, attachment, and social referencing are all apparent with fathers, and sometimes even more than with the mothers, which is kind of interesting. So the mothers are, are generally going to be, you know, just, just out of biology and things, the mother's going to be a stronger caregiver usually, but the father sometimes actually develop a stronger synchrony with the child than the mother does. Um, or at least as strong as the mother does. <clears throat> and in some cases, the father's reactions are actually more important than the mother's reactions for how the baby learns. Okay. It's also true with what the father chooses to do. Um, what the father holds as important is actually more influential on what the child will hold as important than the mother. Okay. So, um, but yeah, there's all kinds of applications for this where it's going to, you know, show up in life, basically. 23, development of social bonds, part five, fathers. Within every U.S. ethnic group, contemporary fathers are more involved than previously noted. For example, my grandfather on my dad's side was a non-emotional person, to say the least. Okay, He was Scotch, mostly Scottish, basically. Um, he told my grandmother on the day they married that he loved her, and he let her know if, if, when that, if that changed. And he didn't say, I love you again, until a couple of years before his death. Um, he never, my dad does not remember ever hearing I love you until he was an adult. Because uh, my grandpa just assumed because he was like, I don't, I haven't like thrown you out. Therefore, you should know that I love you. Okay. Um, so that was my, my grand, my grandpa. Uh, his, his dad was just a flat out abusive. So that was, I mean, it was a step up basically. My dad, because he craved being told I love you and things like that from his dad, made sure that he always told me that he loved me pretty much every day. Um. And then I've, I've taken that and I've based it. But he had a hard time connecting with me. Okay. I've taken what he taught me and then I've tried to improve upon it for my kids. And so it's 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 one of those, it will continue to improve. On the other hand, you potentially have the opposite happening. It gets worse and worse and worse. Generally, as a society, though, we are getting better. Okay. Um, involvement influenced by many factors. So social contexts, right? 1930s, 1940s, 1950s. Uh, Men were the, were the breadwinners. That's just what their role was. So, you know, mom takes care of the kids, takes care of the house. Dad goes and works and brings home a paycheck, and that's it. Uh, nowadays, it's it, it's expected that the dad will be more involved with the kids generally. Um, within group role models, if I have good role models within my group of people that I'm hanging out with that are doing that, there's more likely that I'm going to do that also. Um, there's less rigid gender roles. Again, we don't have that, like, this is dad stuff and this is mom stuff. Um, and then there's cultural variations, even today, right? Some cultures are going to be more or less likely to uh, to do certain things and to, oops, sorry, to accept certain things um, and to promote certain things. Okay, so hopefully that was not too vague. Um, this is also going to be a very much a part of, of social referencing, though. Um, we're, 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 as adults, even, we're social referencing those around us. Okay, let's see. Real quick too, fathers do play an extremely important role in, in, in the development of an individual child. You need a father and a mother to get like all of the tools available to you because um, males just will in interact with children differently than females, okay? Now there's gonna be personality traits and all these kind of things that cause differences. But just the, the way that they engage, the brain of the male, remember we talked about how the brain changes different because of the hormones that are present? The brain of the male will cause you to engage with a child differently than the brain of a female. And because of that, it comes out, basically it gives you a more well-rounded experience of life. Does that mean that if you don't have one or the other, you're totally ruined? No, not at all. But the environment that is the best situation is one of having both. Okay. And it doesn't have to be your father necessarily, right? It could be an uncle, it could be a grandfather. Uh, and same, it doesn't necessarily be your mother. It could be a, you know, it could be an auntie or a, or a grandma or something like that, or even a, you know, step parent on either side. Uh, but it is important to have both involved with the development for both boys and girls. Okay. Slide twenty-four: theories of infant psychosocial development, part one. Um, psychoanalytic theory. We're moving into some of the different theories of what's going on. Freud is our guy here. Oral and anal stages is what he says is going to be the things here. Oral stage is the first year. Um, this is where the mouth is going to be the primary source of gratification. Remember, 
Freud felt like we were, we were driven by our sexual energies. Okay. That sounds weird when you're talking about babies, but that, that, the, the idea here is the, 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 uh, the libido, the energy of the libido is essentially what is pushing you forward into the development. First year of life is oral stage. Everything is basically brought to the mouth. Babies bring everything to the mouth. It's all about breastfeeding and, 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 you know, getting all their needs met through the mouth, essentially. Um, if you get enough of it, <clears throat> you develop well, you have no issues. If you don't, you can have social issues. You can have, um, basically any kind of, of, I think I might've already talked about this in the earlier chapter, but any kind of, of, uh, disorder that's connected to the mouth. So if you have a drinking problem or a smoking problem, or you can't stop talking or you're a chronic liar, or you have an eating disorder, he felt like all of those could be tied back to the oral stage in that first year of development. Um, so an oral fixation would be the, the term that he would use with this. Um, so if you know if you're if you're discouraged from the urge to suck, basically, uh, it, you can become fixated upon it. Okay. So each drink, chew, bite, talk successfully, all those kinds of things. If you chew your fingernails, he felt like this was also tied to an oral fixation. Um, the anal stage, the second year, uh, <clears throat> he felt like this was the the, the potential conflict here was going to be uh, you have a potential anal personality. So this is tied. The anal stage is tied. To the uh, the infant's main pleasure comes from the anus. Okay, um, basically bowel movements become the, the big thing um, in this stage, according to Freud, uh, and controlling them. So your ability, you start to learn like potty training toward the end of the stage and things like that. It, the, you're, you're you're fascinated essentially by your ability to poop. Um, anal personality is, is something that can that can arise from this. Again, according to Freud, and these are terms that we hear like in daily life, you know, people talking about it, um, you know, stop being so anal. Okay. Um, this is, that's from Freud, but he felt like if you're overly strict or premature toilet training may result in an adult with an unusually strong need for control, um, which basically leads to this anal type of personality, right? Your overly cleanliness, you're like you're, you're, you're obsessed with everything being in its proper place and things like that. Um, you like everything having a routine and everything's regulated and all that. That would be a, the signs that uh, you were you were probably pushed into potty training too early or, and or it was too strict of a regime when you were getting potty trained. And so therefore you have these issues. Okay. Be aware of that one. Freud isn't a huge, huge player, like honestly, but it is an interesting piece. So Erickson then built on Freud. So slide 25, um, theories of infant psychosocial development part two, uh, the psychosocial theory. <clears throat> Uh, Erickson is going to be who we're looking at here, right? Trust and autonomy stages is what he felt like were the big things. So trust versus mistrust. So Freud is looking at like the, the sexual drives. Erickson is looking at the social drives. And Erickson actually still holds them up much better. Um, trust versus mistrust is the first stage, the first year of life. Infants learn basic trust in the world in a secure place where their basic needs are met, right? I cry. Someone comes in and helps me deal with what it is that's making me uncomfortable in whatever way it's shape or form. Um, as long as that my needs are met, generally, uh, I will develop a sense of trust. If my needs are not met, I will develop a sense of mistrust, right? The orphans from uh, the, the you know, Eastern Europe developed a sense of mistrust because their needs were not being met. They can only depend upon themselves. Uh, autonomy versus shame and doubt occurs in your toddlerhood, so the second year of life. Toddlers either succeed or fail in gaining a sense of self-rule over their actions and their bodies. One of the first words you have to have them learn is no, right? They don't want to do it. No. Um, they'll start to do things that drive the parents nuts. Like they'll go like, they're like, I'm hungry. I'm going to get a bowl of cereal. And they pull out a bowl and they dump the box of cereal onto the floor and get like two pieces into the bowl. And they dump half a gallon of milk out on the floor and a couple drops get into the bowl. And they're so proud of themselves because they've poured themselves a bowl of cereal. And the parent comes in and goes, ah, okay. Big old giant mask, what were you doing? Right, that's kind of the normal reaction. Um, you shouldn't react that way necessarily because the baby or the kiddo, the toddler, is just trying to figure out what they're capable of. Um, the, the, the tricky part for the parent in this stage is to figure out what areas to give them more freedom in and what areas they still really need help with and giving them as much freedom as possible. If the child is capable of doing it on their own, let them do it on their own. Even if it takes 10 minutes and it's driving you nuts because you're like, oh my goodness, just let me do it for you. Don't. If you can help it, don't. Right. 
let the kiddo do it themselves. Um, and that will give them a stronger sense of autonomy and it'll reduce their sense of shame and their sense of doubt. If you struggle with shame and doubt as an adult, there's a decent chance that you had issues in this stage of life with how your parents handled you. Um, so early problems, an adult who is suspicious and pessimistic and mistrusting or who is easily shamed, right? Some, something happens, you're like, oh man, an adult is like, I'm sorry. You're like, wait, why are you saying sorry? You didn't do anything. Okay, that's in, insufficient autonomy uh, can be created. And that, again, that holds up to be fairly true, actually. Um, so there you go. Next slide, slide 26, uh, Theories of Infant Psychosocial Development, Part 3, Behaviorism. Bandura, Social Learning Theory. Remember Bandura is the guy you're writing your paper on. Uh, so his idea is that parents are molding an infant's emotions and personality through reinforcement and punishment. Even if it's not like you know, not, not like spanking or things like that, or not even like timeouts necessarily. Um, a kid does something and they're like, you get praised for it. Okay, that's a reward. You know, you don't, it doesn't have to be very good. You get a cookie. It, it could literally just be like, awesome, good job. And they're like, yeah, make it feel good. Um, on the other side, they do something and you're like, oh man, why'd you do that? Okay, you you just you you just punished them. Okay, um, if you get punished more than you get rewarded, issues can arise according to Bender. But behavior patterns acquired by observing the behavior of others. We're we're constantly watching and taking in information. When somebody says, do as I say, not as I do, that is garbage. They are going to do as you do, right? If you've ever had a kid around you at all, you know that they're going to do what you do. And they're going to say what you say, which is why you got to watch your language. Um, but gender roles in particular are learned, according to Bandura. If, you're a, if you, you have identified yourself as a little boy, right? You look down and you're like, I got boy parts, therefore I must be a little boy. Uh, you start identifying with your group, which is the other boys, the other men in your life. And you're going to shape yourself to what you see. Same with little girls. Okay. Girls look down and like, I don't have the boy parts. I got girl parts. Therefore, I do what the girl group does. Usually. Okay. Um, and so that's kind of where we pick up our cues. And that's why different cultures, like there aren't really any gender wise. There's no real preset rules, like not. It's not a, a biological rule that if you are male, you wear pants, and if you are female, you wear a dress, right? And in some cultures, you'll find that there are you know, men that wear dress-like things and, and women who wear pants-like things, and that's acceptable. Um, but that's those are learned practices. Okay. Okay, next slide. The effects of parenting, slide 27, proximal parenting. Um, so caregiving practices that involve remaining distant from, the, oh, sorry, where am I at? Caregiving practices that involve being physically close to the baby with frequent holding and touching is proximal parenting, right? You're in proximity to the child relatively constantly. Um, so yeah, this is, these are, these are uh, going to have some different effects on you, okay? Distal parenting or distance, you could think of, right? Distal, distance. Caregiving practices that involve remaining distant from a baby, providing toys, food, and face-to-face -face communication with minimal holding and touching. According to behaviorism, uh, each action uh, reinforces a lesson that the baby learns, in this case, about people and objects. So, um, so let's see, what can we do with this? Uh, so distal parenting, so that if you're, if you're the distant, right, you're the, what you're going to find is actually this is, there's some cultural tendencies here. Um, distal parenting is going to be very much reinforced or utilized in societies that, that very much, uh, favor the, the, the individuality of an individual. Okay. Which that sounds like, I mean, you're like, what? But, uh, versus societies where the group is what's important. So distal parenting, you may produce children who are actually, they experience more self-awareness because they spend more time on their own doing what they want to do. Um, but they're oftentimes less obedient. So they're more likely to be like, I don't want to do that. Like, I don't care what you told me. I'm going to do my own thing. Okay. Um, proximal parenting can produce toddlers who are less self-aware, right? They kind of see them that it takes them a little longer to, to break that, that sense of them being part of the mother and things like that. Um, but they're also more compliant which seems like it'd be potentially a good thing as you're, if you're a parent, but it really depends on what your society holds as important. If your society holds the group as what's truly important, 
then then that that uh, proximal parenting is going to be a much more important thing. If you're like, <clears throat> go get them, you know, it's, this is your thing, you know, survival of the fittest or whatever, or you know, you can be whatever you want to be. All those kinds of statements that is signs of distal parenting. Okay. Um, neither of these is good or bad. It's just different, and it's going to cause different effects, basically, in how the child is seen. Uh, <clears throat> what they found is with these, uh, again, culturally, you're going to find like Western Europe, Northern Europe especially, and in like United States, Canada, um, you're going to find distal parenting to be the kind of the go-to. Most of Asia, okay, um, most of Africa, South America, and Central America, uh, proximal parenting becomes a bigger thing. And you'll also find that in those cultures that like the family and or the community is really what is in, in like pushed forward compared to the individual. Okay. The good of the family is what's going to be the, the driving factor there or the good of the group, the clan, the, the tribe, the, you know, whatever the community as a whole, all those things. <clears throat> okay. Uh, let's see. Slide 28 theories of infant psychosocial development part four. Um, cognitive theory. There we go. Sorry, my brain is like turned off for a second. Uh, working model. Set of assumptions that the individual uses to organize perceptions and experiences. Uh, so the child's interpretation of early experiences is more important than the experiences themselves. This is why you could actually have multiple kids. They experience exactly the same thing. Their, their interpretation of it can differ significantly. <clears throat> Me and my sister, we had, I mean, we, we were raised in the same household, same parents, um, same basic activities and things. You know, we, we both did 4-H and, and martial arts and music and, I mean, we, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, but when I when I have recollections of what happened as a kid and she, she remembers the exact same things, we remember them very differently oftentimes. Because how I interpret it was different than how she interpreted it. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so the experience itself isn't as important as how the child takes it. Is it good, bad, ugly? Okay, all that kind of stuff. New working models can be developed based on new experiences or reinterpretation of previous experiences. So uh, as new information is coming in, we basically can reshape how we uh, perceive the world. Given that new information, we have to to some extent. And or we can make it fit with what we've already got. And in some cases, that means we have to actually change our perceptions of previous events. Okay. Uh, good, bad, ugly. Doesn't matter. Like, but all of these things are going to be kind of how the brain is constantly working things into our, our experiences. Um, so, so childhood is going to be where we basically form our working models of how the world works. And even though they're going to you know, change throughout time, they're gonna, as, as you grow older and you have more experiences, there's going to be shifts. That initial, those initial models are going to have echoes that kind of come throughout your entire life. Okay. They are the foundation upon which everything else is built. And even if you're, you're constantly kind of reworking them, it's still that foundation. Okay. Um, for example, let's say that everyone in your life has treated you well. Okay. You're 18 now. It's the first time out on your own. Everyone in your life, everyone you've ever come into contact with has been looking out for your greater good. And now you go and somebody shows up or you go to, you go to buy, I don't know, a used car. Okay. Uh, you go to buy a car for the first time and the, the car dealer is not looking out for your good. He's looking out for what he can get off the lot that he's trying to sell and no one else wants it. Okay. Um, so he swindles you basically and he gets as much money out of it as he can. And that for your first time in your life, you're like, oh my goodness, somebody did something bad to me. Okay. You've suddenly had a, a shift in your model of how the world works. Not everyone in the world is looking out for you. On the other hand, maybe everyone has treated you like garbage your entire life. And you're like, man, I just don't trust anybody. And for the first time in your life, somebody's going to do something good for you just out of the goodness of their heart. And you're like, what's in this for you? You know, what's the angle? Uh, like, can I, like, I don't, you know, nothing is free. Why are you just trying to give me this help? Um, that is a, a shift in the model. Okay, both those extremes aren't good. You you want to you you need a real a realistic approach or a realistic view of the world to get through the life well. But those are going to be kind of how that works. Okay. Slide twenty nine: theories of infant psychosocial development, part five, evolutionary theory. 
A uh, human child must be nourished, protected, and taught much longer than offspring of any other species. Infant and parent emotions ensure the length, this lengthy protection. Um, the more advanced the creature, the longer it typically takes, and we take by far the longest. Uh, the next closest things that I can think of are like elephants and gorillas take a long time, but not even not that not as long as we do. Um, so yeah, parent emotion ensure lengthy protection. Essentially, the reason that we love our kids, evolutionarily speaking. Is because otherwise we'd leave them. <laughs> You're like, this child won't stop crying. I'll leave you here. We don't do that, right? We want to. We want to make sure our offspring make it, uh, and we want to do everything we can to, to to boost that. And so, because of that, um, our our feelings of attachment and things become extremely important, um, and our willingness to get up, go above and beyond, even when it's stressful and uncomfortable. And like babies are very stressful, um, even if they're a wonderful baby, they're very stressful. Uh, and with that, it it, it those emotions are very important. So evolutionary theory holds that the emotions of attachment, love, jealousy, even clinginess and anger keep toddlers near caregivers who remain vigilant. Picture a two-year-old on their own out in the woods or in the middle of the savanna or something like that. They are, you know, predator bait, basically. Um, so it's important that they stay close to the parents so that the parents can basically watch out for them. Uh, and that's true to some extent even outside of those environments. So allo care, the care of children by caregivers who are not their biological parents is important according to this uh, evolutionary theory, right? It takes a village, not in the Clinton form of that idea, but in the sense that if, if I've got a family or a clan, you know, like I grew up in a small town, for example, uh, everyone knew me, everyone knew who my parents were. And basically I had like 40 moms and 40 dads in this town uh, because they were all, looking out and watching and observing and, and, you know, correcting and helping and all these kinds of things. Uh, that's what allocare would be, that kind of a situation. Traditionally, that would be like your tribe or your clan would, would, would everyone in that would be, have some kind of responsibility towards you. Okay. All right. Random fact number three, the Hobbit has been published in two editions. The first uh, version has Gollum betting uh, and losing the ring willingly. Um, you can actually still get your hands on it. There are that's out there. It's hard to get, but you can find them. You, if you actually get a, like a legit first edition, that's amazing. That's probably worth like a ridiculous amount of money. But uh, you can get reprints of the first editions that give you that version of the story. So if you like Tolkien, it's worth it. Um, if you're not a big fan of Tolkien, or you're like, hey, it's okay, don't worry about it. It's not really worth it. But anyway, yeah. So the Hobbit. Um, there you go. All right. <clears throat> uh, theories, uh, let's see. Oops, I didn't push forward. Slide 30. High quality daycares. Uh, so high quality daycare during infancy has five essential characteristics. These are going to be the things that basically like you're looking for if you are looking for a daycare. Um, or if you're looking for working in a daycare. One is adequate attention to each infant. Um, with that, what you're going to be looking for is small groups, okay? Uh, you, you, you want a high number of workers or, or caregivers to the number of children involved. Um, so yeah, and a rough thing, if a child's like one, you're kind of looking for like two to three kids per caregiver. Um, for two, you're looking for two to four-ish kids per caregiver. Three, three to six, okay, so on and so forth. That's kind of the, a rough, a rough way to, to figure it out. Uh, that'd be optimum, okay. Um, what you're also looking for beyond just the numbers is that they're that they're reliable, that they're loving, um, and that there's that there's a certain sense of continuity, right? That they're they're getting the same caregivers every day, um, and it's consistent, okay. Um, if, there, if there's lots of turnover, for one thing, that's a big red flag if there's lots of turnover because that's that's a sign that there's probably issues at that place. Um, but the other thing is that's going to that's gonna make it difficult on the child because the child begins to form attachments to those caregivers on a day-to-day -day basis. And then if, they're, if that caregiver is removed, it's basically the same as losing a parent over and over and over again. So um, two, encouragement of language and sensory motor development. Um, so infants need language, right? They need to be hearing it. They need to be singing songs. They need to be um, having conversations. They need to be hearing positive talk, getting getting you know praised for when they do something well, right? Um, 
Yeah, I mean that, that's going to be that's going to be a really important part of this. Um, and then also connected to that, also um, the sensory motor development side of things, they're going to need easily manu or manipulated toys that are age appropriate for their for how old they are, depending on how old they are. Um, but things that they can basically work with, like blocks and things like that, or rattles or or those weird little like balls that have like lines running through them and things and rattle, you know, things like that. Um, appropriate for the age uh, available to them. Three, attention to health and safety. Um, so cleanliness routines, right? Like hand washing, like some basic stuff there. Um, accident prevention. Um, you don't want like, if you're bringing like a two-year-old to a caregiver or a, a daycare and there's like marbles everywhere, right? You're like kind of a red flag, might not be your best one because um, they can swallow it. Um, safe areas to explore, right? So there's, there's, there's lots of activities that are, again, age appropriate, but it gives them that sense that they can kind of climb into or over and, and you know, through and all those kinds of things um, is that's a high thing. Um, professional caregivers. So you don't just want necessarily just like random people, right? Um, they should have some kind of level of experience. Uh, degrees and certificates are going to be a plus, right? That, that would definitely be something that I would look for if I was looking at the daycare. Um, specifically in early childhood education, you know, some guy who's got like, well, I got a degree in biology. You're like, well, that can help you with this kiddo. Um, so yeah, you know, looking for, for good quality, low rates of turnover. Just like I said, for professional caregivers, you're looking for a place that they like to work. They, you know, if you, if you look at a place and they're like the average, uh, times that people have worked there is like a year or less, not a good thing. If you look at, there's like, let's say there's five caregivers at a small daycare and, uh, they've all been there for four plus years. That's a good place. That's a good sign. Okay. Um, you go in and everyone's happy to be there. They're like excited that they're working there and the enthusiasm to be doing what they're doing is, is really evident. That's going to be all factors there. Um, five warm and responsive caregivers, uh, right they're, they're, they should be engaged with the kids. They shouldn't just be over. They shouldn't just be over here, right? They, they should be engaged, present, working with them, talking to them, playing with them, um, you're, you're, you're looking for a certain level of noise. Okay. Um, and it doesn't have to be like insane. Like you walk into a place and everything's it's out of control. Uh, that that's kind of a red flag too, but if it's quiet, okay. Especially if this is daycare for small kids and it's quiet, and all the kids are way over obedient. Okay. Um, interestingly, we might look at that and go, oh, this is nice. Like I wish my kids would be quiet and, and so responsive. Uh, but it's actually a red flag that the, that the caregivers might be unresponsive. Um, so that's something to be aware of and to look for. You can find all these things in more in depth on page 149 of the book. Um, so just be aware of that. Okay. Last random fact. A cluster of bananas is called a hand and a single banana is called a finger. There you go. So bananas, you got a whole bunch of them. It's a hand. You have one, it's a finger. Okay. Slide 31, conclusions. Individualized care with stable caregivers seems best. Relationships are important. Each infant needs personal responsiveness. And instability of non-maternal care is problematic. I actually knew a young man who, uh, he had a nanny. She was from Mexico. Uh, when he was three years old, she was deported. And he lost all of his hair. He actually had an auto, he ended up developing an autoimmune disease um, or issue where all the hair on his body would fall out whenever he'd become stressed after that point. Uh, and they, they connected it to the loss of that nanny. And so that's, you know, it can be, it can be pretty traumatic for children to be losing their caregivers regularly, but that's an extreme case, but you know, that is something that can potentially happen. All right. And that essentially is that chapter. Like always, if you have questions, send me a message, you know, even send me an email or, or in the D2L there, uh, hit me in the, up on the discussions. Um, make sure you do the quiz so you get credit for watching this since you spent the time watching it. And we'll go from there. Okay. Um, so yeah, have a great one. Again, I'll see you in the next video. Uh, looking at chapter five. In the next videos, we're going to be moving up into the, the early childhood. So looking at ages two to six approximately. Um, and, and as we move through that fun, exciting time where our brains are really beginning to turn on. So again, have a great one. And I will see you all in the next video.